Uh, we are a publicly traded company. I will probably speak just briefly about some projects that are upcoming. Don't make any of your investment decisions based on those, all the requisite weasel words that I need to put out for our legal team. Um, so who are we? Uh, Liquidity Services is a family of B2B marketplaces um, operating in the circular economy. We like to say we power the circular economy, and what we do is we help businesses of all sizes, uh, commercial, government entities, retail, um, recover value for their surplus assets. Um, we do this by, again, helping them bring to market in an auction format selling directly to uh, other businesses as well as to consumers um, really throughout the world. Um, and our mission as we get to the end of it is to, to create unlock liquid value uh, for the sellers, create value for the buyers because they get a good deal, and ultimately keep goods out of landfills by extending their useful life. We operate in pretty much every industry uh, really around the globe. Um, so everything from, from aerospace, biopharma, biotech, um, industrial manufacturing, heavy equipment to retail returns. Uh, for those of you that, that buy things throughout the holidays and then send them back to your favorite giant big box retailers, eventually those things will find their way over to liquidation partners um, like us that again, help extend the useful life uh, of those products. Uh, we have about 15,000 clients globally. Uh, we compete about 900,000 sales transactions uh, a year across our marketplaces, and we have about 5 million uh, registered bidders and buyers um, that operate against uh, our platforms. I wanted to jump back you know, for a second. Again, it was started out saying goodbye to our pets. Who's familiar with the cattle versus pets analogy? Anyone? Okay, I see a couple of hands. All right, this has been around for quite some time. Um, most of what you'll see in my presentation, I cannot take credit for. I just amalgamated things that have been floating around for, for quite a while. But back in uh, around 2011, uh, a gentleman named Bill Baker at Microsoft was talking about scale out versus scale up architectures. Um, and then uh, you know, Tim Bell at CERN picked it up and he presented it in this slide over on the right, really trying to explain the difference to people between those bespoke, craft-built servers that many of us know and love, right? You know, going all the way back to the days of inserting the disk and building up from bare metal, for those of you that got a little gray hair, um, you know, remember those days, right? And those were your pets, right? They had fun names, we cared for them, we fed them, we loved them, and we cried when they went down because bad things happened in your business. Right. And then we move towards cattle, and cattle got numbers, um, and it's a horrible analogy, but it's kind of you raise cattle for slaughter, right? So they got numbers, they were duplicate copies of one another, and you were scaling out your infrastructure. So if we continue that, that zoomorphic metaphor for a little bit, right, we had, we had start with pets, Again, those initial servers. We moved to cattle. That was like our virtualization. And then that virtualization moved up into our cloud providers, our, our Azure's, AWS, et cetera. These become your EC2 instances or your Azure instances uh, of your VMs. And we say cattle are better than, than pets, right? It gives you more flexibility. You can do things programmatically. You start moving towards infrastructure as code. Then chickens came along. And if you're not familiar with chickens, right? Chickens are your containers whether it's EKS or the others, right? And why? Because they grow faster, you feed them less, right? And they hit maturity really quickly and you can scale them out really quick, right? And so you're like, yep, I've got my containers now moving along, my containers therefore are better than cattle. Again, lower resources, faster scale, my infrastructure is getting a little more flexible. Um, and then I ran across a gentleman, again, there's references at the end, uh, flocks of birds. I was gonna say, because again, we have to continue this, this analogy at Ignatium. Um, and flocks of birds are your platformless elements. So your Lambda functions, your S3 buckets, um, your other components that you're using to assemble applications in order to create business value. And so with that, again, the theme of our, our talk here, you know, around moving to platformless, Right, is those benefits and saying, gosh, you know, in our platformless structure, those really are better even than our containers. Now, I'll, 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 we'll preface that with there's always uh, interesting cases or uses for, for different workloads um, you know, within there. But as we're moving down this continuum to platformless, there you go, you want to get with your, your flocks of birds. But I started this with legacy, right? And, and I'm tying legacy and pets together in here. And so I said, what is a legacy system? Um, so this gentleman, actually, I, I asked him if I could put it, I had to blank out his, his name. Um, for many people, legacy was whatever existed in that environment before you started. 
I don't know how many people are, are application developers here. Um, I, I, I love this again. Yeah, there you go. I was going to say this. This was, I think, his attempt at asserting dominance. Is how I saw one of the, uh, the the quotes in this thread of like, you know, show up again. If you don't get it, you can look up the the reference later on um, within there. But it was about you know these things that kind of set in the environment that we look at in hindsight and go, gosh, why is it still there? And again, these things are our legacy systems. So in preparing for this, I, I did what any, I would say, good presenter would do. A few years ago, I would go to Google and say, you know, hey, help me understand what legacy systems are. Instead, I went to my trusty co-pilot and said, hey, legacy systems last for seemingly forever. Why? Help me understand about four or five good reasons why legacy systems exist. Well, you know, it actually came up with some pretty good answers, right? Proven reliability, sure, it's the technology you know, right? And it's there and it's meeting a business problem. Um, data preservation, hey, it may hold everything that your business has ever done locked up inside of that system. So gosh, yeah, you don't really want to get rid of it. Um, you're familiar with it, right? We know how to make that technology work, right? It could be cost effective, um, you know, in that way. Um, and then that operational continuity because change is hard. And so when I look through this lens and I think about legacy systems, um, I had the benefit of, uh, of uh, visiting a town called Segovia uh, in Spain not long ago. And what Segovia is known for is a about 2,000 year old Roman aqueduct. Okay, and I look at this through that lens of legacy and I go, wow, right? This is something that is built to last. And it hits all those marks, right? It's purpose built. This thing delivered water. This thing delivered water for the town of Segovia until 1973. It was their primary water supply. Um, it is still the backup water supply in there. So from that standpoint, right, it is rock solid. It is reliable. It is purpose built to do just that thing. Okay, and it happens to be pretty. It is also the dominant feature of the town. You can't go anywhere in that, that old town section without seeing this giant piece of Roman architecture, um, you know, dominating. And so, you know, why are we uh, talking about that? Well, I go, that's a really, really kind of rose-colored look at legacy systems. So again, I went back to my co-pilot and said, help me really understand, just give me five attributes. This time I didn't put my thumb on the scale. I said, give me the five attributes that describe a legacy system. Outdated technology, difficult to modify, lack of test, incompatibility, maintenance challenges. So again, thinking back to my, my aqueduct there, and I go, huh, outdated technology. I don't know how many Roman stonemasons there are that are still in existence that know how to do mortarless construction at that scale. So probably a little challenging to maintain for the town there. Difficult to modify, so that thing runs water, in one direction at a certain grade from point A to point B. If you need water elsewhere in the town, right, they end up building a complex interface to tag onto the end of this thing in order to do something that should be relatively simple, you know, in order to, uh, to divert that water flow, you know, over. Lack of test, all right, that doesn't really fit so well. It's kind of binary, the water's flowing or it's not. Uh, but incompatibility, we've already kind of hit that. And then the maintenance challenges, you know, ongoing. So instead of that beautiful structure that we saw earlier, it's probably more akin to this in a technology space. It may look really pretty, but it's kind of a house of cards, you know, and eventually that thing's going to go over, you know, and when it does, again, it's not pretty. Hence why Segovia moved to a public water system, you know, again, 40 years ago. Many of us are stuck in this world where we have these legacy systems. They are the things that built and powered our business. Um, and now we're at that, that crossroads of, yes, it got us to this point, but is it really going to be what enables you long term? And so we're in this continual balance game of outdated technology, our pets, but they're purpose built. Hey, it does exactly what I need, but it only does that one thing, right? And it has this limited functionality, but our customers love it. Well, do they? Uh, sometimes they really hate it, and we just don't want to acknowledge it. Um, and so we're in this, again, kind of continuous flow back and forth of, again, moving past the legacy systems. So I'm going to talk about one of our pets um, you know, that we had. So again, I, I mentioned we operate a family of, of marketplaces. Our flagship is GovDeals. 
This is GovDeals back in 2013. So GovDeals is, again, two-sided marketplace. We service about 13,000 or so state and local governments here in the US and in, in regions of Canada. And again, they can sell any of their surplus assets. So 2013, uh, you see it, it kind of looks like a red, white, and blue version almost of, of Craigslist. Um, this is from the Wayback Machine, so there's some broken images and, and things in here. If I went back to 2000, it probably looked about the same. Here it is in 2019, okay? Added a few more categories, still the same application, still the same user experience. 21, we went along, still the same application, still the user experience. We got a slightly better logo, right? And we took out some of the colors at the top. Okay, but that was it. And, and it was, all right, this thing was driving our business. Okay, this was one of our pets. Um, it was a little challenging to maintain. So this is a cold fusion application um, that was running against direct virtual machines you know, you know, on down. And so uh, again, we can still find cold fusion developers, but that's not exactly you know, the, the top of folks list typically when you're out, uh, out recruiting. Nothing against my CF devs, they're awesome. Um, but you know, this is what we had to do in order to maintain this application. But it is what powered our business. So again, setting in this, this mode. Um, so I sat back and I said, gosh, we really, um, we need to move past this. Now, fortunately, we had just launched our new platform, Lot2, that was powering one of our, our smaller sites, All Surplus, um, you know, at the time. And that site was growing and was performing well. And so I sat back and went, okay, um, I need to have, a, you know, I would say great architectural strategy, all the things CTOs are supposed to do. No, instead, I cracked PowerPoint open and I said, okay, board, we need to move forward and we're going to improve the buyer experience for GovDeal. So this is the actual slide I used when I was justifying um, this project, you know, over giving an initial update. Um, and I said, we want to improve that buyer experience. We're going to do that. Yes, there's one little line there that says modernize the technology. But below that is what really mattered. We're going to increase the GMV, so the gross merchandise value that this marketplace produces. We're going to do that by bringing a fully mobile responsive site experience in. So yes, this is around 21, and we were not really fully mobile responsive um, you know, in there. Um, we're going to introduce a, a global navigation with cleaner page templates. We're going to bring an AI ML powered site search and recommendation engine you know, on board. Um, and we're going to introduce multilingual capabilities and a bunch of other, I would just say, elements inside of that. Um, this one little line really was this for the team. So we're going to rebuild this as a single page application, um, you know, fully orchestrated with our containerized services, some microservices and functions. Um, we're going to replace that on-site search again with that AI ML powered search service read third-party service provider, you know, inside of that. Uh, same thing with our product recommendation engine. And then we we're going to build out the DevOps pipeline that we needed behind it in order to deliver um, this capability over to the business. But notice none of that was in that slide, right? It's one little line, modernize the technology, because that isn't unlocking business value. That's an enabler for that goal that we're trying to achieve. So our approach was evolutionary, I will say not revolutionary, and in that we are a Scrum Agile shop and we deploy uh, roughly every two weeks uh, is kind of our cycle right now in our sprints. Um, and that's how we went about delivering this application. We took the base of our Lot2 platform and we started building out the new GovDeals experience you know, on it. And when we reached a point where it was good enough to start introducing to customers, that's what we did. And we used our A-B testing tools in order to control the flow of traffic you know, over to the new site. Um, and then we monitored those key performance indicators in order to determine when to increase the next notch of traffic. And we started with like 5%. And then we'd go to 10, and then 20, and then 30, and then back to 10, um, because we saw something we didn't like, right? And, and we'd go through that iteration. We did this over the course of many months um, until we reached a point where we were comfortable as a technology organization, our revenue team was comfortable with the performance of the site, and we said, okay, now we're ready to cut everyone over. So the results of that, we saw the increase in GMV. Uh, we actually announced our earnings this morning. I was going to say we're up 11% for the quarter um, of the site. So again, continues to hold over the last few months. Uh, and that came from improving the bid rate. Again, we're an auction marketplace. So the more bids we can get on assets, the higher the value is going to go up. Uh, and again, recovery, uh, improve recovery for our sellers. We had year-over-year -year organic traffic increases. And again, we achieved the bulk of our technical goals. We also received some negative feedback from some of our customers. 
primarily because there were features that we missed, things that they liked about that old legacy system um, that we didn't include or didn't include you know, completely um, that we went through. Um, and then we found a number of opportunities and ways that we could improve our uh, infrastructure as code, um, our services themselves, and again, help uh, employ the scale. So this was supposed to be about lessons learned. So these are, uh, say, come the, the key takeaways uh, you know, from that project. Um, so the first is that stakeholder alignment. What was the intended business outcome and how are you going to measure it, right? This is nothing new, right? This is, this is the case since the first technology project ever, right? You know, what is the business outcome? The business outcome wasn't modernize the technology. The business outcome was to improve the buyer experience in order to drive an increase in bid rate to achieve a higher GMV, okay? The technology was the enabler for that, okay? How are your different stakeholders uh, who are your different stakeholders, um, and how do they view that system? Again, do they see the big, beautiful Roman aqueduct, and they are really embedded uh, you know, with it, and they love it? Or do they see the house of cards, right? Do you have internal stakeholders, external? You know, for us, we had the technology organization, our customer service team, and our revenue team internally. Externally, we had sellers, and we had buyers, and we had very different groups in each of those um, that all had a say in how we were gonna go about delivering that effort. Um, and so getting to a common vision of what success looks like, and then the vernacular that you're using throughout the project effort is key, um, again, in order to, to have that moving forward. Um, are your expectations reasonable? Again, classic trade-off triangle, time, scope, money. You know, is it appropriate for, for what you're uh, tackling? And what's your team's track record? Um, with respect to large projects, particularly the transformation. Again, we had just come through our Lot 2 project, and we were on about a two-year run of this incremental delivery, and so we had established the trust pattern with our revenue team that we could do this. Uh, again, and then we de-risked by doing that controlled cutover uh, of traffic in order to, again, reinforce trust within our business partners that we could make this transformation and make it fairly seamless. Um, and then ultimately, what's your company culture? Are you revolutionary or, or evolutionary? For us, we are very much an evolutionary um, you know, culture. So uh, we're, we start with the, you know, don't, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it, you know, kind of starting point. Um, and so we look at that and go, we're gonna incrementally build and transform into the architecture that we wanna have. Um, so from a technical architecture perspective, um, what's critical to your organization? You know, anytime you're starting into one of these transformation efforts, you know, I'll say, what is your special sauce? What is the thing that you really need to hold and do as an organization internally versus what is a commodity service that you can acquire that's gonna get you to that end goal faster? And so with that, you know, I, I pose the question to a team often, are we solving a solved problem? Because that's not very interesting, nor is it cost effective uh, for the organization. So at each step of the way, we're looking and saying, if this is a solved problem, right? Where can we employ it? That's where you know, our search uh, service came from. That's where the product recommendations came from. And as we look out at the future, it's where our WSO2 identity server is coming into play as we go through and replace um, our internal um, identity store. Do you have a solid understanding of the cost implications as you migrate from pets to flocks of birds? Because it is different. And if you are a CapEx heavy organization and you suddenly jump to an all OpEx model, you better have had a conversation with your finance team first. If none of those words make sense to you, come talk to me afterwards. I'll be happy to walk you through it. Or more importantly, go talk to your budgeting and finance group so that it doesn't bite you later. Okay. Uh, what are the performance requirements and how are you going to test them? You know, so again, and that's both you know, the, the user experience testing that you're doing as well as down underneath the performance testing that you have going through the architecture. Um, how are your security boundaries changing? Uh, again, it's a different world when you move from that server that you control, again, initially in your data center and then in your effectively cloud data center over to assembling business applications in a platformless manner. You know, so that observability, the monitoring and zero trust really, really are important. And so step into your architecture, having done your research to make sure that you really understand, again, how your security boundary changes and how you're gonna protect uh, your assets. And with that then comes, are you, support, um, are you prepared to support what comes out on the other end? 
Um, so again, there's shifts in the skill set needed in your team. Uh, again, oftentimes in the tools that you are using uh, in order to deliver that, that application. So again, you need to prepare not just for the initial transformation, but the transformation is beyond the application. It's into the run operate model um, of your business. Okay, so where are we going next? I would say same thing we did yesterday, right? We're gonna to continue to enhance the user experience. That is our ongoing um, challenge and, and mode of operations throughout um, our organization is we're in a continual quest to make better tools for both our buyers and sellers, you know, and again, so that we can unlock value, again, in those surplus assets. Um, we're doing this similar project effort right now for our seller tools. So it's another one of our pets. Um, setting kind of in the backside, and it is the, the, the primary interface for our sellers. Um, and it looks pretty similar to what you saw early on for, for GovDeal. So we're going through that effort right now. Uh, by this time next year, we will have uh, you know, completed that, uh, that element of the transformation and said goodbye to a few more of our pets. So with that, going back to our, our, our metaphor here, um, where are you in your journey? Um, if you've got pets, Everybody does, right? They're hiding there somewhere. I was going to say, it's just acknowledging them and, and realizing how you move that continuum over towards the right, um, towards that flock of birds. You know, as you do, offer yourself a little bit of grace, right? Be pragmatic and realistic about what you as an organization can absorb. You're going to hear lots of things throughout, again, this conference, other conferences, lots of papers, Gartner, all the analysts, right? Here's the thing that you need to do and you got to do it now. You need to do what's right for your organization at the right time. Um, so having an idea of where you want to go, you know, is that roadmap. And then the how and when, right, is really our challenge as technologists to, to, um, to figure that out with our business. Um, because every organization is on its own journey. Um, with that, I'll just leave you with the kind of final thought. Um, technology is the tool we employ in order to achieve a business goal or to unlock business value. It's not the end goal itself. Right? It is the enabler. You all, everyone in here, myself included, we are the enablers for unlocking business value, unless you happen to be a technology company. Right? If that's your primary business, different story. But otherwise, I was going to say you're really here to unlock business value. A few of the references you can go through when they post the slides online later. You can see, you know, again, I blatant plagiarism of a number of folks and their metaphors, and I thank them for it profusely. Um, and with that, are there any questions I can answer for you all?